There's a lot of nonsense spoken about <coughs> spirituality. You listen to some people, it's all birds and trees. It's all spirituality without any reference to faith or to Christ, as so though there was something there before Christianity that was not devoted to our understanding in the church, but was something pure that the church corrupted. To listen to some people, Celtic spirituality is about getting to that unpolluted core and reanimating it again. But this is profoundly to miss the point, it seems to me. And the clue lies in St. Patrick himself. There was a raid for slaves, and he was taken off and tended animals for years, six years. Whereas he writes, he learned to say a hundred prayers by day and a hundred prayers by night, and he grew in love for God so deep that his entire impassioned life was taken up with speaking about Jesus Christ and communicating his love for God to the people he had come to love. For he escaped, and unlike any of us, I suspect, he decided to go back because he had fallen in love with those people and their sense of optimism. And John O'Reardon, in a lovely book called Irish Catholic Spirituality, has tried to sum up what it is about Ireland and its people. Perhaps it's a slightly rosy view, but there's something in it. And there's, there's something in it which is therefore a natural fit for the Christian faith. And he lists a number of things. First is little or no distinction between the material and the spiritual world. The sense in which Heaven is second nature to the Celtic Christian. The presence of an immanent God whose creative energy is in all things vibrant in them, transforming them. Even though they appear to be in the world, they are in heaven. So is spirituality too, in harmony with nature, accepting it, respecting it, in love with it. And a natural religious spirit in the people. Modern Irish Catholic spirituality is often condemned by the Celtic spirituality industry as alien to their spirit. But there's something at the heart of all that love of the imminent God ever present in all things, the creative energy of God. Uh, that is also, it has another side to it. It's penitential. It's ascetical. It's serious business. As Dee Dyers was reminding us on our first evening, pil pilgrimage is not about escapism. It is not about trying to be so heavenly minded you're no earthly good, as, as Wendell Holmes once said. It is about the ability to face the harsh realities of life and to live through them with hope and goodness and justice and faith. So at the heart of Catholic spirituality in Ireland, in the 19th century for instance, you have this great resurgence of devotion, popular piety that is extremely demanding. <coughs> And you can still see it marking the life of the Catholic Church in Ireland to this day. But far from being a 19th century importation from continental Europe, or a way of trying to repress and convince people of their guilt, Irish Catholic people are accused of having uh, guilt as their main motivation and religious instinct, but... It's only half the truth, because it actually 
took on all its popular form because it's resonated with an instinct of people, a penitent, ascetical instinct, not one that does human nature down, but that appeals to its deepest emotions and hones it and purifies it and perfects its love because the love of Christ and the love of Mary the love of the great trinity are at the heart of what switched Irish spirituality on when St. Patrick saw in them, the people of Ireland, this great sense of spirit and community and love for each other that he thought was ideal for hearing uh, the Christian gospel. <coughs> Indeed, the word for people in Irish, for living together as a community, is a loan word. It has been borrowed from another part of Europe. It is the word monastery in Irish. Monasterium becomes monto, the word for people. Monastery is never a building. It is the bond of kinship and closeness and harmony between people in Christ. And it was transferred, therefore, to re refer to the whole of the people. And Munteras, this idea of community, is still used in Irish as a way of describing this sense of uh, solidarity, you might say, this sense of belonging to each other. And this is very, very important because often in Irish spirituality and prayers devoted to Jesus, you will hear him described as king. And it's easy for us to think in terms of a medieval monarch or a Byzantine emperor to use a very different way of understanding what kingship means. Perhaps it's come from the scriptures, perhaps it's come from Greek philosophy, perhaps it's come from our own history and the way it's been coloured by wars and majesty and grandeur and power. But in Ireland the king is the loved head of the family, somebody to whom you are related. Indeed the word king in English is the same word as kin, kinship, kin, kin. And so in understanding Jesus Christ, Irish people would have understood him as somebody who was intimately related to them, somebody whom they knew through and through, somebody whom they were fiercely loyal to, somebody who summed up everything about their sense of who they were as a people, as a community, something deeply significant about what they wanted out of life, who they were when they related to other people, and who they were at their deepest moments of passion and sadness, as well as their most exalted moments of joy. And here is a prayer from AD 700, written by Vlamach, son of Kubreta. It's a sort of stabat mater, but it gives you this idea of the kingship of Jesus Christ, and imagine him as the head of your little tribe, your group, the person closest to you for protection, whose death is an outrage, it's a body blow to the whole of the people, to your whole group, your family, your community. And as, an of, as often in Irish spirituality, this prayer to Christ is addressed to Mary because they are inseparable. We're all the same family. <coughs> Come to me, loving Mary, that I may keen with your very dear one. And thus, that your son should go to the cross. He was a great diadem, a beautiful hero. When every outrage was committed against him, when capture was completed, he took his cross upon his back. He did not cease being beaten. The king of the seven holy heavens, when his heart was pierced, wine was spilt upon the pathways, the blood of Christ flowing through his gleaming sides, 
it would have been fitting for God's elements, the beautiful sea, the blue heavens, the present earth, that they should change their aspect when keening their hero. The king was patient at the crucifixion of the only begotten. For he, for had his good elements known, they would have keened sweetly. <coughs> and another from a century earlier, 665, Abbot Mansion Leith. I wish, O Son of the Living God, O ancient eternal King, for a hidden little hut in the wilderness that it may be my dwelling. An all grey, lithe little lark to be by its side, a great clear pool to wash away my sins through the grace of the Holy Spirit. Quite near, a beautiful wood around it on every side to nurse many voiced birds, hiding it with its shelter. A sullen aspect for warmth, and a little brook. Across its floor, a choice land with many precious, gracious gifts, such as be good for every plant. A few men sense we will tell their number, humble and obedient to pray to the king. A pleasant church, and with the linen altar cloth, a dwelling for God from heaven, then a shining candle above the pure white scriptures, one house for all to go the care of the body, without ribaldry, without boasting, without thought of evil. This is the husbandry I would take. I would choose and will not hide it. Fragrant leek, hens, salmon, trout, bees, raiment and food enough for me from the king of fair name. And I to be sitting for a while, praying God in every place. This idea of God, Christ, as the King who provides for his little people, his little group that he looks after, whose death is an outrage, who takes away everything that the little community can hope for, the little people, the munter. This is why in Irish passion spirituality, there is such a deep sense of lamentation. Of course it's in all our traditions, but it's because of this Irish sense of close-knitted bondedness that the expression is so deep and appealing, at least in my view. Let me have from you my three petitions, beautiful Mary. Little bright necked one. Get them, son of women, son of women, from your son who has them in his power. For you, bright Mary, I shall go as guarantor. Anyone who shall say the full king shall have his rewards. I call you with true words, Mary, beautiful queen, that we may hold converse together to pity your heart's darling. So not only outrage and loss and deep lamentation at the taking away of the king, the king of the seven heavens, but also a turning to his mourning mother, solidarity with her, a sense of worthiness and reward that we should join her in bearing her burden and sharing the king the lamentation, the sorrowing for her dead son. Here is the Keening of Mary, a traditional poem undated. The Keening of Mary. And you get this idea of the whole church, the whole community being bonded together in this lamentation for Christ. O oh, Peter, O oh, Apostle, have you seen my bright love? I saw him even now in the midst of his foemen. 
Come hither to Mary's, till you keen my bright love. What have we to keen unless sweet keen his bones? Who is that stately man on the tree of passion? Do you know your son, O mother? And is that the little son I carried nine months? And is that the little son that was born in the stable? And is that the little son that was nursed on Mary's breast? Hush, O mother, and be not sorry. And is that the hammer that struck home the nails through him? And is that the spear that went through his white side? And is that the crown of thorns that crowned the beauty of beautiful heads? Hush, mother, and be not sorrowful. Hush, mother, and be not sorrowful. The women of my keening are not yet born, little mother. A woman who weeps. By this my death there will be hundreds today in the garden of paradise. Right in the midst of this keening and lamentation and the sense of outrage at the taking away of the king, the provider, the blesser of souls, there is still this sense of the imminent power of God, the energy of Christ to create all things, the hints of paradise, the good news, you might say, of the resurrection coming. Ancient Catholic spirituality in Ireland, ancient Irish spirituality, because you no point in saying Catholic then, because the church was not divided, of course, was deeply committed to the idea of the cross. And we heard from Dr. Barker the other day how the sign of the cross would be made upon the Christians uh, upright in imitation of the high priest who had the sign across him in a sort of X form. And St. Patrick was well known for referring to the cross in almost every action. It, would be, it became a part of the rule of, 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 of the monks that everything that they did, they would make a sign of the cross over it. Or beginning anything, they would make the sign of the cross of their forehead. So, so much for Irish spirituality being about birds and trees and creation and the environment had nothing to do with the Christian faith or our sense of sin or our sense of sorrow for our dying Lord. It's deeply imprinted right from the Christian outset with the cross, but never a sign of defeat, always a sign of blessing and of victory. And there was a discipline imposed upon the monks of Ireland, uh, that, especially in the reforms later on in the 9th century, that they would use uh, a devotion called, if I can just find it, the Shrine of Piety. And it was using the cross as a way of binding the great power and energy of the Creator, the great power released by Christ on his cross, the provider and king for his people, to myself. And you will all be aware, we sang a little bit of it last night, of St. Patrick's breastplate. But to the Irish person of those centuries, contemplating what had been done to Christ, it was everything as it should not be. It was an overturning of the creative power of God. It was an overturning of the <coughs> hierarchy of the universe. It was an overturning of everything that was known to them in the Monteras, in the community, in the people. It was an overturning of the sense of a person's identity within that Montero. And so the monks and any other pious uh, person was invited to pray the Shrine of Piety. And one of the features of, the, uh, of Irish Christianity was praying like this, with arms outstretched. We, we know of this gesture from uh, the Mediterranean world, which we still use to this day in our liturgy of, of, of holding our hands out in the Oran's position. Uh, slightly closer to our body. 
that the cross was so important and all embracing, the power of the King that provided. And you see those representations of our Lord on the great high crosses of Ireland. This is not a criminal whose power has been held back by the nails, but this is an all-embracing, powerful, bestowing blessing creator on his cross. And they imitated this in their prayer. And they would pray St. Patrick's breastplate, or a prayer like it, in six directions, so that all that was lost and all that was unraveled and all that was disordered could be bound up again by the prayer. And they would pray to east, to west, to north, to south, downwards and upwards. They would make the sign of the cross and they would say, O God, come to my aid. O Lord, make haste to help us. Which begins the offices of all the uh, liturgy of the hours in our Latin rite to this day. And at the end, I will pray that uh, in the same way, just before we end our Passion Tide, Irish Passion uh, devotion uh, uh, to honour the feast of, of St. Patrick. <coughs> but please do not think that Irish spirituality is about defeat or guilt or obsession of personal devotion. It is entirely about our sense of community, about our belonging to Christ, our beloved King. It is entirely about depending upon the creative energy of God who is recreating in all things and whose power is ever present to us and whose power by the sign of the cross by the power of his passion on the cross, we, 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 we bind to ourselves every single day. And in coming to think of our Christian faith through an Irish lens of many centuries ago, it's appropriate to end our thoughts before we say the binding prayer, or I will say it on your behalf, you don't have to join in, uh, it's, it's appropriate to put this once again into the mind and the heart of the lamenting mother, but also into her protecting hands, her maternal care, and her love for her son that is also necessarily her love for us, because we are related to him, he is our kith and kin, she is our queen. No more than that, because we know her. She is part of our people. And this prayer to the Virgin has been likened to the Akathis that we will pray <coughs> tonight when uh, Metropolitan Callistos serves it here. But I hope this may be a little preparation for that beautiful service too. We ask Mary to look after us to invoke the blessing of her Son upon us, and most of all, to give us the power of his cross. Gentle Mary, noble maid, and give us help. Shrine of our Lord's body, casket of the mysteries, Queen of Queens, pure holy maid, pray for us that our wretched transgression be forgiven for your sake. Merciful one, forgiving one, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, pray with us to the true judging king of the goodly ambrosial clan. Branch of Jesse's tree in the beauteous hazel wood, pray for me until I obtain forgiveness of my foul sins. Mary's splendid diadem, you that saved our race, glorious torch, orchard of kings, brilliant one, transplendent one with the deed of pure chastity, fair golden illumined ark, holy daughter from heaven, mother of righteousness, you that excel all else, pray with me your firstborn to save me on the day of doom. Noble, rare star, tree under blossom, powerful choice lamb, sun that warms everyone, Ladder of the great track by which every saint ascends, may you be our safeguard towards the glorious kingdom. 
fair fragrant seat chosen by the king, the noble guest who was in your womb three times three months, glorious royal porch through which he was incarnated, the splendid chosen son, Jesus, son of the living God, for the sake of the fair babe that was conceived in your womb, for the sake of the holy child that is high king in every place, for the sake of his cross that is higher than any cross, for the sake of his burial when he was buried in the stone tomb, for the sake of his resurrection when he arose before everyone, for the sake of the holy household from every place to do, be thou our safeguard in the kingdom of the good Lord, that we may meet with dear Jesus, that is our prayer. Hail. So lastly, we turn to that dear Jesus, and thus the power of the Creator, the power of the cross, the power of the prayer of Mary and all the saints to be upon us in every direction. The six directions of the Kai Ro, the Kai and the Ro of ancient symbolism, was used as the symbol for this prayer, to accompany this prayer which you will know, Christ before me, Christ at my right hand, Christ behind me, Christ at my left hand, Christ above me, Christ below me. And I'll pray that shrine of piety prayer now, and saying with the sign of the cross each time, in each direction, O oh God, come to my aid, O oh Lord, let me haste. Do it in each direction. <coughs> O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, O oh God, come to my aid. O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, O oh God, come to my aid. Oh Lord, oh God, O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, make this help us. O oh God, come to my aid. O oh Lord, make this help us. O 